I keep it. I keep um, it a little bit, a little bit ambiguous uh, because right. you know, prior to the pandemic, you know, all of us, were, many of us, were just moving back and forwards. I'm not saying it's like the, you know, most environmentally uh, comfortable way to to exist. But I was in London a lot, and in Berlin a lot, and other places, and Amsterdam. So it, you know, I didn't really have to sort of add a place to my work, as it were. Um, mm. And now that's what we're all doing. So. <laughs> but when you, okay, but when you um, think about a context in which you operate or a context that um, taught you how to see and think, mm. is that London? Definitely. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's principally where I grew up. Like my formative years are spent in London. Uh, I wasn't born. Um, I moved around a lot as a child, but London's always been the kind of anchor for me. And certainly throughout the course of my adult life, I was there. I built my career there. Uh, it's informed so much of the way I see the world um, in terms of how I dealt with culture, different cultures, and that engagement with people, the drive that you have to have to kind of establish a career. Um, and also it kind of makes you quite economical, like you can move quite quickly with ideas and with projects and products because you have to, like because mm -hmm. tomorrow you've got to be doing something else, you've got another deadline. So maybe you get home this evening and I just pr produce this work and it's done. Um, and there's a, you know, in terms of like what you're talking about in terms of like architecture and other fields, I think London is a really good example of how that does work successfully um, in terms of how people kind of bring their work together in conference spaces and exhibition spaces and so on. So that thing about London that gives you that opportunity to kind of, you know, have access to a lot of different things. Mm. And then if you compare that to Berlin. <laughs> yes. How is it? Uh, hmm. You know, it's interesting because Berlin doesn't, it, it has that. I mean, obviously it's a much smaller city. So, so when I say smaller, I say that it's historically it's more fractured. So mm. it, it has to keep kind of restarting itself again. It has to keep going, you know, getting, getting moving again. And I think the most recent era of that is only what, late 80s, early 90s, when it was yeah. reestablishing itself again. So right now, Berlin has been finding its feet as a kind of, modern capital driving thriving economic place like it's and then the pandemic has hit now so i don't know what that's going to mean for the future of the city but it's it's younger in that respect like london is mm -hmm. way more established so you know that there are institutions and not just like in the traditional sense but there are institutions of thought of expression and there are things that pop up and sporadically mm -hmm. like develop movements ideas you know you see that with the music scene in london you know like there's always these kind of eras and they, they happen really organically from the kind of social dynamics of the city. Um, whereas Berlin's history is, I think it's, uh, it's really fascinating being here. I think, I, but I'm watching a place that's still quite young. Mm -hmm. I see particularly the kind of East-West divide, like it's still there, it's still really noticeable in terms of how people conduct themselves. Um, in terms of how they drive for, for their careers, in terms of how the wealth is uh, is kind of distributed. Like it's really noticeable, you can see it. Um, so I, I kind of watch all these sort of, you know, these aspects of the city. And like I was saying, you can really feel its recent history. So like you can walk down like uh, Karl Marx Alley and you can really feel the city. And that's, a lot of that is through its architecture, is through its use of space, which is really dramatic. It's mm -hmm. not that what you would have in London, for example, <laughs> in these tiny narrow streets, you have these vast boulevards that have been designed for that sense of scale, that really like psychological impact, you know? So, so I am experienced in Berlin somewhat as an outsider, but I, I sort of, I quite enjoy that. I get to treat the place as a kind of muse, as it were, you know, it's not, I'm not from here, so it's not my, so my heart so I can enjoy it. That is interesting because I think uh, during the last year, one notion that's really been challenged is the kind of, is the idea of home. Mm. 
um, in a sense, we've been forced to establish home almost uh, by governments. Yeah. Um, you know, through the restrictions, you kind of have to yeah. say where you are and where you're from and, you know, the radiuses or, you know, you're allowed an hour walk a day or something like that. Yeah. So I think we've kind of were shifting this or there is a kind of a renewed emphasis on home. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, how's your sense of home changed, given that you're also between places? Yeah, that's a, that's a really huge question for me, my friend. <laughs> In the best way, but it's, it's a big question. It's a really big question because, oh God, it's, it's, so, it's so incredibly layered for me. And as a result, I mean, we all find in this moment difficult, but I find it particularly difficult because, let's say, kind of metaphysically speaking, I've established an idea of home for myself that isn't attached to a place. Mm. And I think that there's so many layers to, to why that is. Um, I have a kind of fairly tense relationship with my Britishness, I suppose I would say. Um, it's really complicated. Uh, it's, there are aspects of being British that I've always loved and appreciated. And then there are others that are I think quite deeply problematic in terms of how the country doesn't deal with its colonial history and that sort of thing, which is, you know, it's changing now. Um, so I already had that kind of slightly detached relationship with Britain, which is why London was so good for me. So the London that I grew up in, which I think it's changed quite a lot, unfortunately, you know, it, the cultural center is sort of is being, ex being excavated, people are leaving, like most of my friends that came from all over the EU, all over the world, most of them have left London. And they were there for, you know, over a decade, a long time. So that was, the, that was where, that was the place in which I was comfortable because I could hide in London, you know? So there was always a sense that, that that was home because it wasn't really home because London doesn't have this kind of sentimentality about home, you know, it's just like, it's this, rapacious kind of machine, you know, you go in, you get absorbed, you get discarded, like you know, it's a constant cycle of bodies and like money and everything. Um, but I always quite enjoyed, I enjoyed that because it really is a really dynamic place. And then something started to shift for me about, okay, like, I think it really, it really started to shift around about the time of the 2011 riots in London. It was, it was, there was a, like a symbolic moment there because, you know, I lived in East London for many, many years. I lived in South London for many years. So I always was very aware, like acutely aware and watch, as I walk the streets, I watch the kind of shift that was happening in these areas. So the kind of tension between those, you know, that had lived in Hackney since the sixties with their families and the people moving in and, you know, living on the estate on this side, living in the private housing on this side, you know, the gated communities, you know, kids going over, stealing stuff, going back home, you know, like I, I was watching all of this stuff. So I, I was very like tuned into it. And around the 2011 riots, it was the first time I really paid attention and I realized what was happening, particularly with conservative power that was establishing itself. And not to say that the label was amazing, but <laughs> you know, there was something definitely, there was definitely a shift happening. And it was the way that I think so much of the, let's say the cause of the riot was the riots were completely ignored. And there was this sort of blanket demonization and they, no one even for a moment cared to consider or even understood what the reaction was, what the, what the call out was. They saw it as just purely nihilistic. They didn't want to kind of engage with what the machinations of what was going on. I knew exactly what was going on. And, and that was the first time I started to feel like, oh yeah, this is the part, yeah, this is the part of Britain that always made me uncomfortable. And now it's coming up to the surface. And then a few years later, so I, you know, I lived in Hackney and Dalston for a long time and I'm watching all this stuff going on. And a few years later, then I started seeing like Theresa May's like, you know, she had these, when she was home secretary. Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. 
exactly. So they, all, all these vans started creeping around Dalston with these, emblazoned with these hideous, like, you know, signage, like the semantics of it was so intense. Um, you know, basically, if you don't have the right papers, you should leave, et cetera. And then they start raiding shops and all these kind of things. So I'm not actively affected by any of this, but I am affected by it. And I was saying to my friends at the time, and not many people were really sort of paying attention to what I was trying to say. I said, this isn't about people with, without the right papers. This is actually about destabilizing multiple generations of immigrants in the UK, making them uncomfortable. Do so you remember all the rhetoric around migrants and so on? So anyway, so that, I was just really acutely aware of it. And I realized that, so maybe it was just my own maturity, but it coincided with this like reestablished kind of conservative party. And I just sort of, I think because I do, it is my home. And I think that's why I decided I didn't want to be there for a while. And then I left after a few years. So it's, it's, a, very, it's a very deep thing. So now like the pandemic is almost, been perfect for those trying to establish this kind of order about, you know, which borders you stay within, you know, <laughs> which is an incredible thing, the timing of it, right? Um, so the way that I live, many of my friends live, my generation has lived, has been completely shut down, almost. So I think that's a really, that's a huge thing for a lot of us to try and figure out how to deal with. So I'm living in Berlin at the moment, I don't particularly want to be a German citizen. But why should I have to? Um, additionally, it's already complicated for me to think about doing so because I already have a complicated relationship with my own citizenship, or like, you know, at least conceptually speaking. So then to try and take on another is even, is even weirder for me. You know, so there's all these kind of things. There's a real challenge in terms of understanding what home means and what one's personal space and agency and ability to kind of move between places I mean particularly if you have that in your history so your family is i mean my parents obviously you know traveled to uk from nigeria via, via germany actually so my father studied in germany and did a phd here and then they moved to the uk so that movement is a natural part of my own history i mean it's a natural part of human history you know but so I don't know what it means for me now to try and establish that sense of home because I don't really believe in it. Like I feel like it's clearly enforced upon us and maybe it's just entirely bureaucratic and economic. I feel, I feel like we've got a bit of a kind of modern warfare thing happening and globalization has integrated everything to such an extent that we can't just be throwing bombs at each other, at least in the West. So we've got to do all this kind of more passive, passive aggressive stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> and drag it out for five years, you know, so, um, but we are just collateral damage, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, we're just in the, in, the, in the midst of this and there's nothing much we can do about it. But I think I am personally quite challenged by it. Um, like I said, in a more kind of sentimental slash meta metaphysical way because of that already disconnected relationship I had. Some of my friends are less bothered about this. They're not really that talking about it that much. They're like, okay, well, yeah, I'll just get papers in Germany or so on. But I, I see this more symbolic to an end to the way that, end of a particular way of life, basically. What, what is, Berlin give you though that does it give you the distance from a kind of painful um, or difficult experience um, or does it profoundly offer you um, a way of practicing that is productive and you know, that allows you to produce work and um, think and um, just be. Yeah. Um, I would say it does a bit of both, actually. Um, I have a quite a long relationship with, with Berlin. I've been coming here for many, many years, um, since I was like really in my early 20s. So um, 
friend from my friends and I would we, travel here and we spend a few days here and we were all obviously really into like electronic music and just hang out here and stuff so and then over the years I had a number of friends that moved here so it operates like a second city to me I, I didn't have to kind of just arrive at this new place and then like you know go figure things out and meet people I was already I was lucky enough to already have a network. network yeah exactly and like I was saying it was a lot of the people that were also in London and then you know musicians artists so on who were probably getting priced out of the city and had to move. I mean, I would, fortunately, I wasn't I wasn't in that situation economically. Like, I could have stayed in London. Mm -hmm. um, but to answer the second part of your question, you're right in that what that what moving here does is change the balance for me. So it's more um, living like the live work ratio basically shifts. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I, when I say live, I apply that to my own personal work as well. Like I don't. Of course, yeah. Yeah. So, whereas in London, you know that probably between hours of nine a.m. and five a.m., there's a certain amount of money you probably need to make mm -hmm. <laughs> to make your existence in that city worthwhile. So the standards, the standards of living are very, very different. I think you can live mm -hmm. on less here. I'm not saying it's particularly cheap, but there's a there's a kind of there's a kind of cadence to the city that is less intense as London, for example. Like you don't feel that you're necessarily gonna get ripped up every single corner as you might in London. So you, you know, you go to the underground station in London and between last week and the next week, the, the, the ticket's gone up by two pounds and you're like, oh, <laughs> you, know, so you, know, you, you don't, it doesn't have that same kind of rapacious desire to strip you of the other hand. Um, and I like, I like that. So it's, it's more calming. So I change the percentage of my time in terms of what, like what I'm doing for money and what I'm doing for work. I mean, they're very interconnected now, but the, the balance is probably 60, 40 here. Whereas in London, it may be 90, 10. And I think that that's, that was a, one of the key reasons as well. Yeah. Moving is just to have that space and also just personal space, like, you know, bigger place to live. Yes, physical space. Yeah, physical space. And like I said, why the streets? It makes a huge difference somehow. Mm. Like, I, I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm not berating Slagging of London. It's, it's still a place I love and I probably will move back one day. But there's just something about the, the physical space that you have in the city of Berlin that is, I find quite, um, I've always found it quite attractive, even when I didn't really understand what it was. I think I understand it better now. And now I really do it. And I, I walk a lot in, in Berlin in ways that I probably wouldn't in London. Mm. Yeah. That is so interesting. I mean, it's kind of, we've kind of gone in a, into a direction that I wasn't anticipating. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're still talking about space though, I guess. <laughs> we are. Um, I mean, what's kind of also interesting is that there is this, and sorry, I'm now kind of trying to get deeper in. Mm. Sure. But, um, there's something interesting in that process of detachment from where you think you're from, mm -hmm. you know, where you feel you're from. And, you know, it might be, it might be an experience that your parents have had, your grandparents, and that you have had in a slightly different environment. Mm -hmm. So rather than moving from Nigeria, you said, to Europe, here you're moving from a country that's almost in a kind of conceptual sense, abandoning Europe to Europe. It's an interesting, it, quite interesting relationships. Um, so cross-generational geographic kinds of relationships that have certain similarities. Yeah. Mm. But there's also, in a way, there's differences because you know, my parents' decisions were probably more economic than mine. Mm. Like, I didn't move to Europe for money. I would have stayed in London, you know, if I was, if I was just trying to chase as much money as possible. Um, that's the really interesting part of this. Like, what did I move to Europe for? I moved to Europe, because I mean, I've always been in Europe. Like, I've never seen myself outside of Europe, you know. We'd get on the Eurostar, go to Paris a weekend, have dinner with friends, go home. Like, we've always, we've always been like this. Um, so me moving to Europe 
is very interesting in the sense that this is the this is the oldest let's say maybe one of the, the oldest economic parts of the world in terms of how the economy applies today so it's established itself in such a way that it's got these some these ideas of <clears throat> which you could not you mean you know there's there's a there's a there's problems within what i'm about to say but it's established a certain kind of liberty, I guess, is what I'm saying. So it's, it's absorbed a lot of things, like it's problematic in a lot of ways. Mm. Um, but there is a certain way of living that applies to what we had been aspiring to in London that I think is being now, you know, you could, you could even say there's a younger generation that's kind of becoming a lot more conservative. We were basically the opposite of that. And I think Europe is like still clings onto the dying embers of that really, that sort of open, forward thinking that hasn't necessarily addressed all its problems. Like France has, hasn't dealt with its problems, its colonial problems, hasn't dealt with its problems of Islamophobia. Like Germany has its own stuff going on. Yeah, <laughs> don't need yeah structural issues. Yeah. <laughs> so it hasn't dealt with all those things. But I think there's a particular age bracket that found at a very interesting common ground. And we knew all those things were happening around us and we found each other in a very interesting way. And that's through this kind of sharing of culture and art and music and all these things. And there, there's a sense certainly of the last decade or so of this kind of that itself, like the embers are getting, you know, fading and fading and fading, the fire's going out and that, thing still exists here in Europe in that way. Um, and I guess I'm talking about cities, obviously, but it was, yeah, I guess it was almost like clinging on to just eking out the last few years of that. Obviously mm. the pandemic kind of shuts everything down now, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, but yeah. eking out the last few years of a certain way of thinking. Um, and, I'm, and I am being quite hard on London when I say this, but it is quite a personal, a slightly painful relationship that I have with London in that respect. Um, I remember, I remember like a few years ago, because um, when I was a kid, like we kind of grew up partly in Camberwell, and I remember a few years ago I was in Brixton, and I was just over in London just visiting for a while, and I went to have dinner with a friend of mine in the Brixton Market, and then there were these kind of really sort of bray and mob of like you know, Eton type fellas who um, basically just came in, probably about 15 of them just came in to the restaurant. And this is Brixton Market, you know? Um, and, and I think it was the way that they, cause I wouldn't, you know, cause I hadn't been in Brixton for some years. So it was like, it, it obviously it's changed, everything changes. But it was just the kind of complete disregard that they had for everyone in, in, in the restaurant, particularly the staff that just really, really shocked me because that's not, anything that you would normally see in Brixton. You know, there's a reason like why this place is so kind of popular because it's established certain foundations of culture, West Indian culture, et cetera. Um, and then there was a sense of that shift that was happening again because the Etonians were in there and they mm. didn't have any interest in the culture that Brixton has established over the last 50 years. You could, they're just very clear, it's just patently clear. And I think that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. So that explicit relationship that happens, like Britain has the richest, some of the richest, the oldest like contemporary culture. You know, you think about Notting Hill, you think about all these kind of communities that started these things. Like in that respect, Europe is not comparable. Europe is behind actually. But Britain was so far ahead, it's now gone in the other direction. Do you see what I mean? So that's probably why I, I sort of find myself where I am right now. So what you're saying is that you, you can almost, the, by going to Berlin, you're almost going back in time and you're reliving that <laughs> moment of cultural, a booming, like a booming of a certain culture. Exactly, because maybe I wasn't yet ready to deal with the kind of stripped back conservatism that is very clearly happening behind the, the glass walls of the, the new high rises in London, that's exactly what's happening. So that, that economic focus 
has no desire for the culture that established the city. And I'm not just talking about gentrification, but there's actually like a kind of social cultural hemorrhaging that happens in the city of London. So the, the, the divide becomes more stark, whereas before the divides were there, you know who came, you came from the gated community and you know, but everybody was in the street hanging out together, in Notting Hill Carnival or whatever, but you notice the cultural shift, cultural separation. And that's what the kids are complaining about now. That's why, you know, there's a lot of call for kind of more agency for communities to come through and be seen in various industries and, you know, Black Lives Matter and all these things. There's a reason why that's happening now, because it's been, it was a process that started, whether it's intentionally focused culturally in this way, I don't know, I don't want to speculate on that, but from a kind of data science point of view, you could argue that you could quite easily make that happen. But this, everything that's happening now is a combination, I would suggest of the last 10 to 15 years, because we were actually finding, slowly finding our way into some sort of commonalities, mm. which, then, which then got pushed back upon. And then obviously 2008 crisis and so on. So there's a lot, yeah. there's a lot, a lot of factors that got into this, definitely. Yeah, and then we haven't even mentioned Brexit and uh, <laughs> <laughs> coronavirus. B word, B word, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, Perhaps with coronavirus, everything or there is a certain sense that we are all going to be starting from zero like in terms of urban life in terms of communities in terms of you know not necessarily from zero certainly coronavirus have maybe focused our attention to our very local environments and really local surroundings more than we have had that awareness before but it might be an interesting thing to observe how it will, how cities will, you know, wake up from um, coronavirus. Um, yeah, I'm curious about it too. Yeah, and and you know, it might be that, that that's where we see which cities are more resilient than others, um, which ones depend on that kind of influx. I, I guess. Personally, I have a feeling that one thing that will become apparent is that the strongest communities will prevail. Mm. Um, you know, the cities where the local communities are strong mm. are the cities that will socially and recover um, quickest in, in a way. Do you think there's going to be any, to an extent, any kind of recalibration of what the city is for, or do you mean mm. do you mean that the communities that like maybe are more established over like generations and so on, they they are still gonna they'll be they'll survive this. But I guess what I'm asking is like, you know, there's this there is this like international layer of the city. Yeah. Do you think that that itself changes, or the purpose of the city in that respect changes? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe cities will become less comparable to one another. I mean, there are, to say, there are shifts happening. There's, there's already there's shifts happening here, which um, I think obviously this past year has accelerated. And but it's definitely much more um, focused on tech, particularly with startup culture and stuff like bursaries and various things happening. So. A lot of startups have kind of developed or established in here. Mm. Um, and then that now that seed is growing. So the bigger companies like Tesla is building a huge factory outside of Berlin. So I think that this, I think Berlin was on, on a certain tra trajectory as a city. And I would argue that this pandemic is probably going to accelerate that somewhat. So it's going to be more, I think it's going to be slicker. You know what I mean? It's going to be smoother in terms of its yeah. technological kind of autonomy and the certain kind of person that's coming into work. I think it would. I think it's. I think it's changing already. Then that might also mean that there will be a whole um, layer of society that will be pushed out of the city. Precisely. So it's the same. It's the same. Same story again. This is that Berlin's 
progress in that respect is, is slower um, because of its kind of social history, I guess, as well. And certain legislative measures that are put in place in terms of dealing with, you know, housing and property and, you know, rent controls and, and various things like that, which you wouldn't even dream of hearing, <laughs> you wouldn't be able to hear about in London. Mm. But uh, that kind of thing keeps its sort of social fabric to an extent. It slows it down. But I already know that a lot of young Germans are struggling to live in the city that they, they were born in. Um, mm. You know, you could argue, like myself, just come in here and done the same thing that, you know, people did to us in London. But so that thing changes for sure, because cities are going to independently figure out how to reestablish themselves. But then we have that corporate layer, which is cross-border. That doesn't have to regard border, that doesn't have to regard. And th I think that power structure takes a stronger grip on what's going on. I mean, it already, it already does, you know, it's, it's pushing a lot of like the, the things that are happening geopolitically, but I think they take a stronger hold on cities for sure. Yeah, there might also be a change in consciousness mm. and the value we give to um, things like time to develop your own work, uh, which is the reason why one would have moved to Berlin. Um, which in a way is an economical decision, even though you may you, you may connect your decision more to a, to a network of people. Mm. But mm. you know, you know, having given you know, that comparison of 90, 10, and 30, yeah, 60, it you know, yeah. it's still an economical yeah. calculation. Um, but despite how the city develops economically. Mm. Uh, I hope that there has been a change in consciousness on a, on a social greater level where we've become more aware of the importance of exercising certain urges that have been oppressed by the, um, you know, economic forces. Mm. Um, yeah. And also, and also, if we if we can maybe finally start talking about your work, um, <laughs> um, you know, how does one adjust a creative practice into a creative, perhaps non-profitable practice, into a profitable practice? You know, maybe we've had time to think about these hybrids of creativity. Um, mm. yeah. how, how has what you've done or how you thought about your work, how's that, how does that fit in, into this moment in time? Yeah, wow, that's a very good question because that's, Principally what I spent the last maybe year and a half, two years thinking about, like how to, like, you know, what is the purpose of what we're doing, the creative work, the creative expression, the, the thinking that goes into like what I'm trying to, to do, like what is the purpose to all that? Like what kind of meaning am I trying to establish or associate with my work? Um, and I've had a very kind of tense engagement with the economic side of creativity or creative pursuit. You know, the idea that, you know, it's, it's absorbed into something bigger than yourself and you're doing it for the purpose of just getting, you know, some in invoices paid. Um, it's been, a, it's, been a, it's been a tough thing for me to kind of deal with over the years. And I think as I got older, and my work started to expand, I was much more interested in, not necessarily in a kind of, you know, not the fallacy of trying to establish meaning, but to establish some kind of purpose within like what I'm doing, to control that purpose a bit more. Um, and working with brands and working with companies and that sort of thing, there is very limited meaning that you're going to, <laughs> going to gain from that. Um, and that's why I established House of Thought, because I was started to think that I need to create a more official environment for the various activities and show how they inter intersect, show how they fit together. 
Um, and then I started to think that, well, this is way before the pandemic that because of the kind of increase in, like you say, consciousness of people on the whole in terms of how they're living and how they're consuming and how they're engaging with each other, that we do need to establish more organizations, however big or small, that think about the work that they're putting in the world. They're not just necessarily making visual noise. They're producing things that allow people to, to stimulate engagement, to stimulate thought, to stimulate kind of discussion. Um, so I was always thinking about that, reaching the level of, the, reaching the commercial level, and then the institutions will then want to know that, find a way into doing this at some point. And then beyond that, brands, et cetera, will want to find a way into, into that as well. And that's what's happened over the last, let's say, three years or so, where you know, you've got the likes of Gillette doing ads about masculinity and all these kind of things. So the, the heightening kind of consciousness that on the one hand is quite an interesting um, development, but it's potentially also a very cynical one. And I was really interested in, in establishing something for myself that is pretty uncompromising now. Like how, like how do I communicate how I really think and how is that desirable or valuable to someone else, someone else? Not necessarily financially, but can it help somebody get further in thinking about what they're trying to achieve or offer someone an opportunity to look at something slightly differently? So I, just, I was just doing this like augmented reality project. Um, just a little, this a little thing really, but I was doing it so just before the pandemic started and through, through the course of it as a way of talking about the, again, talking about space, but talking about the digital layer of space and how that now is, is to be kind of commodified and how you're going to be able to buy virtual real estate, basically. It's already happening. And then corporations will take over that virtual real estate. So a lot of people, you know, I see a lot of creative designers and stuff are doing, making wonderful, pretty looking filters and various things to put in augmented reality. Great, but you're essentially creating metadata for the bigger companies to work with. So what, how about I do something slightly different? Now it's not for a huge audience, but I use that environment to try and tell a, a poem, a story about that technocracy itself and try and engage with it. So this is kind of where House of Thought was going. It's just trying to sort of use new technologies and use all the sort of various skills I have, but to, to apply it to actual thinking, if that makes sense. And I think hmm. it, everything kind of gets, it's really, it's, a really, it's a really tricky moment because we're finding ways to kind of evaluate or e evaluate our creativity or our critical thinking or whatever it is. And there are various models that are doing it. Like for example, on the one end, you've got the, the NFTs that are sort of taking root in, um, in digital art now, They're like sort of blockchain-based monetization and control. But that doesn't necessarily create value for me, from kind of from a point of view of meaning. I can technically go in there and use the software and do something pretty and sell it for some a little bit of Ethereum, but it's not a value system for me in terms of my reason for creating this piece of work that is going to speak to someone else, that's going to start a discourse. As a there's no there's no chain there. Um, so yeah, this is kind of where House of Thought came from, and I'm still grappling with this. So is like, House of Thought a chain? Mm. Is House of Thought a chain? Is it uh, a network? Is it, how, you know, how, is it a business model? What? what? It's a, uh, how do I explain it? Because I mean, basically, yeah, I would say it's a hub. It's a hub. It's, it's, it's a hub, it's a network hub. It's me at the center. And I've been lucky enough to work with amazing people over the years and gradually built up that network, partly from just being in London. And that network built up professionally and it went into the art, art, art world, it went into the literary world, it went into kind of slightly more commercial areas. So I had all these kind of connections. And then I realized that over the, over the years when I started doing you know, projects, working with clients and working inside companies, 
that I was good at, I was sort of really an ideas person and I can always find a way to get something made. So therefore it's quite useful to work a lot in collaboration. Um, you know, I might come up with an idea for, I don't know, a short film and then somebody else is gonna help me shoot it. Someone else is gonna do this. And then we kind of, you know, we have this sort of collaborative approach. Um, and then also as time developed, I developed a whole range of skills myself. So I do a lot of stuff just on my own. And then that goes through working a little bit with code, to working in 3D, to doing photography, to shooting film and writing. Like it's all, so it's all the same to me now. It all becomes part mm -hmm. of the same thing. Um, and it might- You've become the network yourself. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So like become a kind of very strange uh, digital hub. And some people would argue against and say that's not really a practical way to be good at anything, but I'm quite defiant and I'm increasingly becoming good at all of those things so that is a really interesting model of creative practice for creative practice because i when i started this series of talks i had this um i had this theory of a magazine individual where we are not really defined by mm -hmm. one thing one profession mm -hmm. one field but we are a kind of cross section at the point in time in which we talk to the world right and it's like a magazine you know it gets published it doesn't get reprinted um but i think actually we've just come to something that i think is even more poignant that is the idea of a network individual where, where you kind of internalize the network basically yeah yeah which isn't to say that the real network um doesn't exist or that it's not a kind of quite crucial so when you when you look at your work you've done pre-pandemic mm -hmm. um and just at the start of this we were talking about um conception and perception um uh, talk um if you were to look at that kind of like body of work that you know, in a series of topics and areas that you were quite interested in um, and that you're still interested in. Um, but the approach you had to them pre-pandemic, how do you think that approach might have been altered now? Mm. Are there any significant changes that this pandemic has sort of stress tested your ideas and that you've had to kind of actually you know, declare some failures. Right. Yeah. This. Yeah. This has been a. This is a good question because this is, you know, putting some of this archival stuff online because I have like so much work that I haven't even put online. I'm just doing it gradually. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's been interesting looking back at some of that stuff because some of it was right on the money um, in terms of what I was trying to think about. Uh, some of it is already not necessarily out of date, but just like, we are there now. We are, we're in that space we were, I was trying to think about. Um, and the pandemic, what the pandemic did is just accelerate that process. So one thing that I've been doing that to bring all this research together and all, not even just research, but just like, I don't operate in a very consistent way where I'm gonna sit and write this theoretical book that's going to be 500 pages. It's just about this. <laughs> like it's much more, like you said, it's much more networked. Um, but what, one thing that I did do uh, to kind of bring a lot, of these, a lot of these ideas together was write a, how do you, write a kind of book of fiction. So I've, ri I've written a novel of sorts, like novel in its traditional sense. It's not a linear novel. Um, and that is probably the one that yeah, I guess in a way it's quite interesting now because when I was writing it, I was sort of writing it for both for now, but for what happens next in terms of the gradual falling away of the importance of the physical body. Um, so again, the kind of networked human as it were. Um, and I was writing this book in that context, like writing it more the experience of existing beyond the body. So that is probably like the kind of most rudimentary description of like post-human. Mm -hmm. um, but I was trying to write into that space without doing the kind of science fiction thing. Um, 
but just doing it as in like this is what this is what's going on this is where we are um and the book is at the moment it's, it's with my agent so maybe maybe it'll find a publisher or maybe i don't know we'll see um but it was very much about the experience of consciousness but outside of yourself so the way that you might inhabit the next three hours of your life but not in a physical sense probably more in terms of like what we're doing now through this engagement on the screen and then when we end this call you might click on the link and watch this video and then send an email to a friend it was much more in that space like what's what's happening with us what's happening with time like what's happening with personal growth and development that's going on in that environment. So the pandemic just kind of, in a way, I had this sort of riot, sort of laugh to myself um, because it was exactly what I was thinking about, but just it all happened at once. Whereas we were already doing it, we were already living in it and it was happening more slowly. And then now that here we are. So, <laughs> so that was quite a, that was quite interesting for me because um, I, I did, I saw, I, in some ways I've let that work go now. So mm -hmm. the pandemic just maybe accelerated me moving on to something else. So if, 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 um, my agent sells a book, then absolutely wonderful. I'd be really excited about that. I think it's still relevant to read, I think, but it was definitely where my mind was previously. And the experience of it is now like living it real time. That's already the narrative in a way. So what I'm doing is thinking about something else, which I that is interesting because we're talking about unpublished text. Do you have the urge to revisit the text? <laughs> I have to resist. I have to resist because there's a point in which you send it and you're like, because this is the kind of work you're right. It's, it's, it's particularly if you're writing about technology, I think it's really hard because, you know, the way that, as you know, the way that tech works is quite iterative, you know, so you, you would never have a finished product. Like you just keep tweaking it and have another version and you put another version out. And, I, and the problem is you can't really do that with a novel. You can't do that with a book. <laughs> I mean, there's an argument to introduce some sort of, you know, model, um, but nobody really does that. Um, so at some point you have to kind of let it go. And I think that that's the hardest part. But what I did with this book is that I it didn't explicitly write about the technology. I wrote about the experience of living inside the technology. Mm. You know, like the kind of, not necessarily the uncanny space, but the things that are slightly hard to quantify, like the intangible, yeah. like the slight deviations in your memory, the slight deviations in your perceptions. Mm. Yeah, it's that sort of thing. So in that respect, it doesn't change anything. I think it's fine. Um, <laughs> but it is, it is like, a, it is a very different moment now. Um, so I, I've begun, once the pandemic hit, I really started thinking more about, because I'd had a quite a significant trip just before the pandemic. I went to Nigeria and I hadn't been for a long time. Um, and the pandemic just kind of brought to light my feelings about, again, about home, about this kind of disassociation. Um, and I started reading up on like plants and stuff like that. And, trees and what they're like when you move them and how they react to their new environment, new soil, new light, all these kind of things. Um, and I started developing this other project, which is more around this kind of displacement, but using, potentially using code and using 3D modeling and building like these kind of structures to try and like, see if I can distill some of that, some of that movement or some of that like, or the inability to move, but like working with the dissonance of like being in between spaces, being in between ideas, being in between homes. Um, so that's been the project I'm kind of working on now. Um, and it's still dealing with the kind of post-human idea, but I've moved it, I, it's, it's moved on from where I was thinking about it theoretically. I'm now more in this kind of space of like realizing that a lot of the things that we're aspiring to you know, there's this like kind of pseudo spiritual layer to that the kind of economic drive of Silicon Valley, for example. So we're all getting dragged off in on the whims of a few people who read some Asimov texts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we're all being dragged down into this kind of transhumanist <laughs> place and like, yeah, whatever, guys. But 
<laughs> but what's interesting about it is like some of the things that they're after exist in the philosophy and the kind of theory and the spirituality of a lot of indigenous cultures, like they already exist there. Um, mm -hmm. And that's certainly addictive of some of mine from, from back home, my Yoruba culture. So I've been kind of playing around with that, basically trying to use some technological language to explore new ways of engaging with my Yoruba culture. So that's kind of where I'm, that's the, that's the project I've got in the moment. So it, it's already pushed me into, the pandemic has pushed me somewhere else, basically. Um, mm. Somewhere I find quite interesting. Which also has a certain political um, Absolutely. framework. Yeah. Which could almost be like compared to socialism or... How do you mean? Yeah. Well, the kind of the awareness of community and mm. um, yeah. Yeah. common common things, not necessarily ownership in kind of formal sense, but mm. the, um, you know, that we all own this thing together, yeah, yeah, in a yeah. sense. It's like, a, it's a, in a way, what you're saying is we're talking about selfhood or we're talking about redefining selfhood or maybe I should phrase this differently. We're talking about defining selfhood outside of like capitalism, for example. So then, yes, it could fall in more into the bracket of socialism, but we, you know, and the pandemic accelerates that we're in this kind of really atomized moment. And we already were where, you know, you've got to, produce, you've got to pursue your goals and pay your bills. I got to do the same. And when the pandemic hit, I saw like, oh, this is actually a perfect opportunity for us to, to reassess a little bit around this notion of selfhood. Because, like you say, the, the immediate community around you is going to potentially, you could, if you looked after each other, you could help each other survive. So all, what we're doing is going back to the, it is the previous model. Like the, the self existed beyond the self, it existed in the community self. So your physical community, your village. Though I guess there were some traumatic scenes at the very start where everyone was chasing toilet paper. <laughs> and without... <laughs> Exactly. Quite egoistically, you know, yeah. it was it was a bit scary. Yeah, <laughs> and pasta, <laughs> pasta yeah. and toilet paper. Pasta. Yeah. So it was that it was that kind of thing. Like I was watching that as well, and I went to the supermarket really late at night because I was trying to avoid the hordes. And like there was one packet of pasta on the shelf, and I think that what that was, you know, having having been, you know, in my mother's home in Nigeria, just you know, a couple of months prior. I was just aware of the, the strangeness between those two things. Um, and it, it was just like, we had a tiny, tiny window for a moment into a much more kind of <laughs> egalitarian society. Like the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra, they put all their like concerts online for free. And, you know, for the first couple of weeks, I was just sitting at home listening to this and, you know, enjoying all this kind of open access. And not to say that, you know, that's not a model, like we need, we need to make money, but it was just like, it showed for a moment how, if we are able to restructure certain things, like there, the opportunity, there is opportunity to do so. And then very quickly that door was slammed shut and everybody's just like, like let's ramp it up now. And all the online companies like Shopify and stuff, they started redesigning their code bases and like, right, let's get people buying more and more and more, more. So, you know, the economy has to exist, but, it did, for my, on a personal level, it did open me up to thinking more about producing work that, not so much necessarily just engage with this, but engage with, if we're talking, if the general conversation is about, on the one hand is about, you know, the increasing gap of inequality, um, dealing with the problems in the environment, and who's gonna be affected more likely by climate change than others. On the other side, we're having this conversation about being more equal, being more diverse. I mean, I find all those, all those nodes are connected um, in sometimes quite problematic ways. So I guess for me that I was thinking more about trying to figure out some of the kind of, the mechanics of that basically, those, of, of those sort of relationships between those areas. Um, so even like using 
you know, using Python, whatever to do work on the projects I'm doing now, I'm now trying to theoretically analyze, I don't write it very well, but I'm trying to theoretically analyze what Python is, you know, and understand the language and understand, is this just a neo-colonial language? You know, am I, am I creating neo-colonial work? You know, that's, there's all this kind of stuff. That's, that's, that's where I am. So there is a political dimension to what I'm doing, but I've definitely got to a place where maybe the more theoretical aspects of my work is caring a little less about the, the big machine and it's become more kind of personal exploration. So personal kind of mm -hmm. philosophical exploration, I think that's what's happening. So and in terms of the method, in terms of the, um, the means through which you exercise your thinking, um, your output, you know, we're talking about various kinds of media that you use and mediums. Um, text, image, um, time, right? <laughs> there is a kind of big. I, I do. I do. That the time was quite a. That it's actually a, a word I've wrote in my notes. Um, I think that's something that I have a feeling kind of brings all of your work together. Is a kind of real awareness of time, which mm -hmm. again maybe mm -hmm. that relationship might have also been challenged or mm -hmm. questioned because maybe we've become a lot more aware of death in the last year. Um, but if we're talking about output, is there a hierarchy in terms of mediums mm. that you use? And how, how do you know what's the right way to frame your idea? and your mm. thinking. Mm. Your questions are really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm told they feel a bit like a psychotherapy, <laughs> but I, I don't think like, I feel like you just scraped the inside of my head and you're just like, okay, so like, <laughs> um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, okay, so to break it down, obviously I start, okay, like start at the very beginning. I. Throughout school, I loved literature. And my mother had to work all hours of the day. So I'd find myself, I'd just go to the library at like eight years old and I found books and I, you know, I found Dostoevsky at like eight or nine and I was reading like incredible things like at a young age. So literature has always been my thing. And my teachers were always saying to my mum, you know, your son could be a really good writer one day. And, I, and then I kind of got fed up with hearing it and I was just this very distracted teenager and I went to study art instead and I just dropped it completely. Um, and then all, everything I've done professionally has been, it was primarily visual, but it was always, funny enough, it was always led by language. So, so early on, I was kind of doing really small exhibitions, but they were really word, word heavy. So I was doing video art and using a lot of text. And I once plastered an entire room with just like fragments of conversation that I'd found in the street, just walking around big daily circuits and stuff. You know, so I'd always, always working with text. Um, and then the further I went in my career, I, like I said, I just developed a lot of skills, particularly design skills, because that paid the bills, you know, and that helped me establish myself in London. Um, and I was a designer and an art director, a creative director. Um, so I developed all these skills, like visual skills, I could basically make anything. And then that became increasingly quite daunting because I was like, what do I want to make, you know? So, while I was at Granta um, in London, I started to kind of get more of a kind of position, of kind of spot cultural spokes spokesperson. So I got invited to speak at symposiums and do talks and things. And then I, I, that introduced me to more opportunities to write basically. And I started writing for publications and then I started writing fiction. And I didn't think I would ever get into writing fiction because it is the thing that I ran away from that I was supposed to be good at. Um, so, I, and then, you know, I just basically came full circle. And then gradually, a lot of the kind of the anxiety of knowing that I could potentially make anything visually started to fall away because I realized actually I was always, I always loved writing. That was my thing. That was always, always my thing. And I think I just kind of, it took me a long time to, <laughs> to accept that. Um, 
So, but the it, journey uh, that did yes, that. So exactly, yeah. exactly. But it did leave me with a bit in a bit a bit of conundrum. So, so I am quite intense and quite dramatic in that way. So I basically dropped making visual work for like years. Um, so around about 2015, I just stopped making visual stuff, except for clients. Um, and just started, started to write and started to publish pieces here and there. And then I started working on this book, which is now done. And then once I finished that, then it started to click again. And I realized that actually, the, the, I'm dealing with concepts almost in every single paragraph of what I'm writing. And then I started to find ways in which to filter those out and expand them out into kind of visual ideas, which is, and now it's starting to make sense. So the hierarchy exists because language is first, writing is first. Um, and then occasionally, you know, I've done some, some projects with uh, like Ruth Lees Luxembourg, a photographer at the RCA. And we've done some word image projects in London, like a couple of guerrilla billboards and things like that. And so, even the visual work I'm doing is still language led, but like now I'm starting to understand how the two things can work together. So the project I mentioned to you, the latest one there, it's called Red Earth. That is a classic example because all of those sculptures are actually texts that I've written. So, <laughs> so I'm really playing with that connection now. And I'm starting to understand how it can work together, but I still have to fight with myself not to kind of get too, because writing is much harder for me. I can't just sit down and do it. I can make visual stuff like all the time. It's really easy. Um, but I don't want to just produce just anything. I'm starting to like really play with that ability to, to make, but like the, the fact that the work itself is quite easy to produce, but I'm not, um, I'm working with the kind of tension between like the, the the virtual and the physical, like this this ability to make and produce, and not necessarily have an endpoint, not necessarily knowing that you're going to finish something. This is this is the, I think this is a key part of my working method. Like I'm constantly just doing. It. So yeah, I mine too. Mine yeah, completely, completely <laughs> resonates with me. Yeah. But with writing, it's way more staccato than that. Like I would have a flurry. But don't you think that writing is part of that moving process? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. All the time that I'm doing other things, I'm thinking about writing, all the time. Mm. And then with writing, I have to, I've learned to be a bit more disciplined. Um, and I'm working on the second book now. So what I'm mostly doing when I can is I would do either a couple of hours in the morning or a couple of hours at night. Um, but having, existed on deadlines a lot when it comes to writing it really helps like if i'm writing for a publication or something that i know i need to get it done it's harder working on bigger pieces of course um mm. and that's something i'm still learning like i'm not saying that i'm i'm pretty confident about i'm confident more about my thinking and i'm also to an extent confident about my writing but it's a still quite a young part of my career like it's only about five or six years old and as long as like, I'm sort of cognitively functioning, <laughs> then I hope to do this the rest of my life. You know, that's so I'm, I know that I'm just in that, like a little egg in that process. I'm not necessarily, you know, I haven't been writing for 20 years. So I'm still learning, I'm still figuring that part out. But what I'm really starting to understand now is, is the interconnection between the two things. And particularly, like you say, as being, a, going back to the networked thing, I do work in that way, if I'm really honest about it. Like I do, I do work almost like a digital product. I'm never finished. I'm never finished. A, I've never finished, never finishing a piece of work. Like it's always ongoing. So Red Earth is going to have its first um, kind of exhibition, it's an online exhibition with uh, the Goethe Institute in Johannesburg next month. And that's the first time I'm putting it out, but I just sort of been chipping away at it and developing it since the pandemic hit. Um, and then maybe I'll do something much bigger with it later, but I'm not always not necessarily working towards a goal and saying, okay, that's the end of that project. Like I develop an area of thought and I would like that to expand. Um, so with Red Earth, this to me is more of a research product, project. And I've been talking to a couple of academics that I know about possibly moving it into a research program or something. And that's kind of how I think that that environment might suit me. Like I've always worked independently. Um, 
you know, where you know that kind of there's a there's a tradition of that, I suppose. It's not like a it's not like a kind of anti-scholar, like you're still working with scholarly texts and mm. like resources and ideas and but I've I've never I always kind of like to do it on my own. So not within an academic context. So it's to an extent. So I've never done a PhD or anything, but that's what I've been considering doing now because maybe it's just one aspect of my work that is structured. Do you see what I mean? Rather than it gives you structure, I was just gonna say. Yeah. And that's PhD something that gives I you, I, gives you time, gives you gives you deadline, actually. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's because I think we're always striving towards this kind of freedom, right? We're always like want to be freer and freer and freer. <laughs> and, and it is funny because when you're in academia, you think that the outside world is free. Um, but then when you're in the outside world, you see the freedom of the academic world. Mm. Um, it's, it's a different freedom, isn't it? Really? It's, like a, it's a different kind of freedom. Yeah. Because I, oh, I, 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 had a, I had reservations about being more deeply entrenched in academia. Um, I've worked with academia and I've done, you know, lectures at universities and, you know, I have got involved to an extent. So I, I do know how it works inside. But it's the, so I think, I, I think on the outside, you often have to work much harder to establish the same kind of freedom. Yeah. So you're, the factors that determine that freedom are more external. You know, you have to build up your kind of cultural capital, as it were. And then you can start to eke out some of that freedom. But you're still, to an extent, you're still under duress of the responsibilities that you have financially and that so on. So it's, it's always a battle. Um, but I know that the, the freedom inside academia, like you said, is more what's going on here, which I think is very interesting. I just, I think I always had a reservation about this, maybe the sort of more bureaucratic aspect of it. And, which is, and something else which is changing a lot is the kind of interdisciplinary nature of the way that I work. But I think that it's changed a lot in academia, from what I can see. Yeah, I mean, at the same time, I don't think, I don't think we should glorify either side. <laughs> no. Um, they both have their um, pros and cons in a sense. Yeah. Um, and that's why it's interesting when, as an individual, you attempt to, to establish a framework, a kind of semi-institutional, semi-commercial framework. Yeah. Um, which is a really a, just a conceptual thing, but it somehow allows you to operate. Yeah. And it's, it's a fiction. You say that, yeah. Because it, it comes from, there were practical reasons why I did it, but then the, the frontispiece of it, like the, the thing, the way it looks, the way it exists, the name, all of this is, you can probably tell, is slightly irreverent. And it comes from knowing how to, how to, you know, I've done a lot of branding for companies over the years. And luckily I never really had to do anything rampantly commercial. Like it's always like things in the cultural sector. So I understood what branding was, you know, and to some extent it's like the emperor's new clothes, but it's also in a way it's, it's quite interesting. Like it's quite playful that you can do things with it, like semantically, that like you can do stuff, things with it. So I think I'm borrowing from that for sure. So I'm trying to, I establish this thing where you might notice that it's never, it's never too explicit about saying what it is. Like it's sort of like... <laughs> yeah, ambiguous. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's ambiguous, but the, the, the language of it, the vernacular, the visual vernacular is very simple. It's very yeah, simple, direct. simple, straightforward, random, yeah. Direct yet yeah, uh, ambiguous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I use the same tools yeah, to describe yeah, my work. <laughs> so, so once you start to understand the grammar of that, I think you can really play with it. And I think I gave myself a bit of breathing space to, um, to, be, to be play around and gradually define what it is. And I was fortunate enough to do, be able to do that because, you know, I already have a fairly good rep reputation that I can lean on in terms of building work and you know working with clients and stuff. So I didn't have to start from scratch with it as such. So that's why I can allow it to kind of organically just become, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Develop into a next thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'm thinking about the next thing. I'm thinking about 
like you say, what is the, what is the, what is essentially what is the creative organization for this next phase of, of, of mm. our lives? So I come from, you know, I worked a lot with literature. I've worked a lot with the art world. I've also worked with tech. And I'm like, do I want to set up a small publisher? But publishers have notorious problems with money because they don't have good business models behind their publishers, whether it's niche or whether it's bigger, they all have, they don't know how to monetize books very well. So I don't want to do it like that. Um, can I use more the tech model? Can I use NFTs, for example, to sell books? Like I'm, you know, I'm thinking about, but do I want to make it a bit more boutique where it's just really specific projects that we do myself and my friends? Mm. No. So I'm still figuring out that side of it. And I'm using the same environment to publish, you know, some of the art projects I'm beginning to sort of put together as well as, as well as it being the place in which I communicate with clients as well. So it's still, it's still ambiguous. I like, I, I like that. Hmm. And then there is something in that notion that you mentioned earlier about the division of time. I'm really like that. Um, hmm in terms of what you need to do to um, survive in a society and like economy, mm -hmm. and then what you do to explore ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and I think within that, within that uh, percentage of idea exploration, there is, there is experimentation, right? Absolutely. And, and the reason why I call it experimentation and not just creation is because when you experiment, you ultimately can fail, right? So it's a lot about failure. So actually the 10% or the 10% the in, in London or the whatever 40% in Berlin is the percentage of how much the failure will hurt or won't hurt in a, in a, in a sense. Yeah, so, contributes, yeah. Hmm. so what's your relationship with failure? Or experimentation? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, in London, it costs you more to fail than it does in Berlin. So maybe and I'm just wondering whether as, a, as, a, as somebody who creates, I believe that is a very important ratio. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very important to know that failure is not death, right? No, it's actually quite, conversely, it's actually quite liberating. Yeah. Um, and you're right, because I think you, I would probably, I can only speak for myself, but I took less risk in London. Um, because if you only got the 10% to, to work with, then you know, it's pretty, you know, you've got to operate a little bit more precisely. So I definitely took more, take more risk being in Berlin. I took more risk in my career coming to Berlin in the first place, because I'm disconnecting myself from what I established over like 10, 15 years. Um, and then the additional risk is dumping all of my visual work to go and write a, a book. You know, so I'm coming, like I said, I'm coming back to visual. Um, so, I I, so I took a lot of risks in that respect. Um, so that's why I don't know at what point you, de you define any of these things as failure because they exist within oneself to establish new ways of like looking at what it is you do and why, you know? So even if you do not complete something and there's, and I, I, I never take, I mean, maybe I've been, you know, maybe this is for the psychoanalyst couch or something, but like, I'm trying to pinpoint, or maybe this is just like, evasive, but I'm trying to pinpoint what I would consider to be moments of failure because I wouldn't necessarily see them that way, you yeah. know? 
Yeah, no, I, um, because uh, to define them as failure, I have to define them externally through something else, through someone else. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think the failure would be not taking the risks in a way, you know. Yeah, because I, yeah, I, yeah. I had a lot of opportunity to basically get nice and fat and comfortable in London, um, especially when I finished my last job. I had opportunities to go to much more commercial com companies with much more money, and I didn't <laughs> mm. <laughs> because I knew that I wanted, I knew that I would not be happy. I knew mm. that a few years will pass and then I would have failed because mm. I, would, I would be probably, you know, be relatively comfortable, but I would have failed in that respect. So I think the engagement with risk, certainly yeah. in terms of the- I mean, risk might be a better word. Yeah, 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 definitely. That, that is something that I find quite exciting, actually. That's what drives me. Um, and that's what offers so many twists and turns to my own career. So I'm constantly figuring out, you know, what, what's coming next? What am I doing next, you know? The three environments that have been stress tested over the past year, mm -hmm are really the kind of domestic, yeah. right? Um, the public space, you, you always say how you're quite interested in public space and then, and then the digital space. Yeah. Um, and I think within those three, I don't, I, I'm not sure whether the balances have shifted. I mean, they, they might have shifted from other kinds of spaces that exist around us. I, I, I do have a feeling that these three have had quite a, quite a moment of redefinition. What are you most inclined to explore next? Or where do you see most potential for um, expansion of discourse? Mm -hmm. I mean, it might be, it might be within well, I don't know, maybe within some completely different areas. You, you were talking, we're talking about trees and ecology, perhaps. And I guess there is a whole renewed appreciation or awareness of ecology. Yeah. Yeah. So where, where is the next frontier in, in those, um, if we look at those kind of points of reference? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's like more than one frontier in a way. Like, you know, what's, what was interesting for me is when the pandemic started, um, I still feel it now, but maybe I still feel it slightly differently now. Like, you know, you're talking about time. Like I really had a very dramatic, and I'm sure we all did, had a very dramatic re-engagement with time. But what I started to, see what was changing within myself was the and i think it's, it's still a problematic thing but like i was making this sort of fairly you know irreverent comment that the dream world and the real world has shifted places um because i don't usually remember dreams for example but since the pandemic started i've begun to remember more, more of my dreams than before. And I started to think about what that is. And first I thought it was just the residual kind of shock of the moment and, you know, the kind of weird, strange sense of grief that we all have. But then I thought to myself, actually, I think it's maybe more than that. It's more about time. It's more about my experience of time has shifted. So I'm not, you know, leaping up to run to an office and dealing with all these different things. Like time, is on you know the x y and the z axis if we look at it three-dimensionally um and i think that engagement with time has impacted my other times impacted my sleep time is impacted my waking time my waking time is less stimulated than it was mm -hmm. i'm not jumping on the bus and the tube and doing all those different things i don't have all the ex is external stimulus so that's having an effect on my dreams my dream space but what's also happening is the real stimulator space is the one we're in now, is that online space. So it's almost like, that's what I mean by switching places. So it's almost like there's been a, there's been a little, so if you look at the free, the free axis as it were, or you look at these as three points, the dream space, the digital space and the physical space, I feel like 
the role that they played was, you know, like almost like this just rotated slightly. Do you know if that makes sense? So they all play in a slightly different role now. Um, and that was a very interesting thing for me in terms of that. So the digital space becomes the real space, the physical space becomes the dream space, the dream space becomes, you know, so we're having this, or at least I'm on a personal level, I'm, I'm experiencing that shift. Um, so if, if that's the digital space taking such prominence, um, all those things are already happening. You know, Discord has exploded. Um, there's a lot of like kind of virtual chat rooms that have exploded. There's a lot of blockchain based like virtual environments that have exploded. Like, you know, the kids are like accelerating off into that breakneck speed. Um, and it's already happened in the sense that your social capital, your digital social capital is playing more and more of a role. It has more and more importance. And I've always had a huge problem with my digital persona. Hence me needing to you know, build a company name and stuff because I don't, I, I find it really invasive. Like I'm, you know, me, I'm just that generation. I find it really invasive that I don't have any, that I'm not allowed to have some sense of privacy. But at the same time, the digital persona is not the real you. It's a simulacra, it's a simulated version of mm -hmm. you. But within that, what I find problematic about moving everything into the virtual space in terms of the community, in terms of the discussion, engagement, dealing with issues, I find them in, I find whatever we say, that I suppose this context is interesting because this is actually, it's actually worked against my argument, but I find whatever we say is inherently is inherently a simulacra of what we're really trying to do. Because if you're on Twitter and you're trying to have a conversation with someone, whatever it is that you're doing, unfortunately, you're speaking through this augmented self. The augmented self has a purpose. It has a capitalistic purpose. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why you're on Twitter because you're self-promoting, you're promoting your brand. So whatever you say, however genuine you're being, is already tainted by that very position. Do you see what I mean? Yes. So that's that's what that's the bit that I have a problem with in terms of moving migrating every conversation we have to the virtual environment, because actually it stops us from being really who we are. Like it's it's a simulacra, and everybody knows that. Like in terms of the visual persona, but we don't talk enough about the simulacra of the voice and the meaning and the intention. I think that that's 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 a really key part of the conversations, and then we probably will have a bit of an analog revolution, you know, in terms of people spending more time outside with, you know, studying the rings within the trees. Um, or maybe, hmm. or maybe a new, a renewed relationship to the book. Yeah, which has happened. Book sales have been doing pretty well, surprisingly, hmm. through all this. Um, well, unsurprisingly. Have you, have you read a lot during the, during the last year? I have, yeah. Uh, I try cool. to I try to read a lot anyway, but you know I'm also battling with the attention economy like everyone else. So that's been <laughs> sometimes it's been hard. Uh, but this past year has definitely helped that. And now, have you returned? Have you returned to Dostoevsky, Bernie Charms? <laughs> um, I'm laughing because I'm planning to, um, because a friend of mine has. Uh, well, she's reading Dostoevsky for the first time, and and I thought to myself that I would really love to revisit, revisit Dostoevsky right now because he was very seminal for me um, as a thinker and as a writer, and just in terms of dealing with like the kind of heavy weight of mortality. Um, and I grew up in a Christian household, which has kind of set me up for life in a way that I've been fighting against it ever since. But not in a kind of nihilistic way. Need something to fight against. Yeah, yeah, right. But not in a nihilistic way, but like in a in a way that's always left me with this real intrigue about why we need belief systems and you know an historical ritual and all this kind of stuff. Like I'm really interested in it. I'm I'm still really interested in theology and stuff. 
Um, so revisiting something like Dostoevsky would actually be quite interesting to do right now, and it is on my list to do. Um, I mean, what's I incredible think... about him is that we all found ourselves in this moment of like a year of isolation, but he was sent to a work camp in <laughs> Siberia for 10 years <laughs> with just one book. He only yeah. had, I don't know whether it was Old or New Testament. Yeah. Um, that was the only book he had. Uh, before he, he couldn't produce any work during those 10 years. Well, this is really years. interesting, like this, what you're saying here is really interesting because it, it feeds into a lot of the thinking I've been doing around time over this past year. So our experience of time shifts, and on, in, one, in one respect it's faster, in, one, in some other it's slower, but when you look at periods of history like that, what that 10 years means and what that 10 years would mean now are very, very different things, aren't they? Like in terms of the pace of the pace and the way that you would do things and how you would think about them. I feel like we have done our best to optimize the, not necessarily the experience of time, but what we can extract from it, like the kind of mineral extraction of time, we try to optimize that as much as possible. And I think if you look at something like Dostoevsky's era, that 10 years, might be just 10 years of contemplation in order to write that book. <laughs> you know, like, but where would we do that now? Where would we gather that experience of living and being, particularly for some, with something like writing, if you're thinking about writing something, you're already having your mind where it's gonna be, what it's gonna do. But surely writing is just about synthesizing your actual lived bodily experience. Mm -hmm. And that requires mm -hmm. 